Good morning, my fellow yogic travelers. I'm mighty glad to be alive today, and I hope that you are too, as we continue to live, laugh, love, learn, linger, live the life we love. This is part two of my pilgrimage to the center. This is what you would have been hearing me talk about if you came to one of our Mexico vacations way back in 2001. But these are timeless teachings as far as I'm concerned. So I'm here to comfort those of you who are afflicted and afflict those who are comfortable out of your complacency. God doesn't buy from retailers, only from wholesalers. Once the prayer goes up through the top of the mosque or the synagogue or the temple, God can't tell the denomination anymore, only the purity of a heart. And so they say the higher you go, the more, the less difference it makes till you go so high it doesn't make any difference at all. And that's where like you merge into the oneness of everything. And it's a strange thing because it seems like there's a goal, but when you're practice oriented, well, when you've been on the journey so long that the goal seems further and further away, like all those samadhi states they talk about in yoga sutras, who really experiences that? Well, then you know that the journey is everything and the goal is nothing. So now, just aside for those of you who are practicing yoga, so I'm talking about hatha yoga regardless of what your lineage is. My teacher used to say, you yourself don't know what you're capable of. So when you get on the mat, it's kind of a challenge to find out what you got. And it's harder on you when you don't practice. And when you realize that the only reason why you don't practice is you don't make it a priority. Success comes to one who practices, not to one who practices not. So hit the mat. Yes, each one of us is broken. And I can't fix anyone's brokenness. But I can bless your brokenness and show you that there is pain or suffering in your life, for sure. There's difficulty, to be sure. But you can face this with a certain kind of optimism because... Your Hatha yoga practice toughens you in a certain way. I don't mean makes you mean, but you become like a lacquered cup, not like grandma's china, where if you drop it, it doesn't smash. It has some bounce to it. It has some give to it. So yoga teaches you a certain kind of resilience and enables you to handle discomfort in a way that isn't masochistic, but really learns how to work with the material that you have and turn it into something else. That's called reclamation work. And just like a pearl comes from the irritation in the oyster, or a diamond is made from time and pressure. So you put yourself under the pressure of the practice mat, and all of a sudden something will happen in a week, in a month, in a year, in a decade, in a lifetime. Just keep practicing. Water the root. The fruit is sure to come. So when you understand this, then it's not only in your body you realize the difference between perceived limitations and actual limitations, but in other ways that you think also stories and narratives that limit you to only this or a certain label, and you realize you're so much more than that. So this is where you have to take a risk. Like we say, death is what says play it safe. Life is what says take a risk. And when you take a risk, what you're going to have to find out is how do you affirm your potential? You have to find your own wizard, like in Wizard of Oz. He affirmed the potential of the Tin Man and the scarecrow and the cowardly lion. Each one just needed something to remind them that they already had brains, they already had courage, they already had a heart, as each one of us does also. But sometimes you have to acknowledge it yourself. It's not always that you have a teacher who can do that for you. And also, if you're a maverick or a rogue like me, you realize, like Jung said, organized religion is a way of preventing religious experience. It gives you liturgy, it gives you words. It doesn't always give you a direct oomph of the spirit. So although we go to a doctor and expect a prescription and then a relationship and then eventually personal responsibility, so that's how it is with a yoga teacher. They give you the asanas to practice at the beginning because they just said, oh, you don't need anything, just live your spiritual life. You think they were a charlatan. Then if you keep coming to class, you have a relationship with this person. It's very, very encouraging. But after a while, they realize they're trying to wean you away from dependence on the class so that you end up practicing on your own self-responsibility, self-empowerment. The buck stops here when you practice yoga. So all I can say is keep doing it because happiness is not within the field of self-consciousness. You just have to be so lost in doing the thing that you love that you forget about whether or not you're trying to be happy and you are happy without you even realizing it. Like when you're dancing naked in the room and all of a sudden someone comes in, why do you stop? You become self-conscious. So just put it out there. The earth is never hurt by a bad dance. Love your freak flag. Be loyal to your freak flag. 
have natural defiance. We all hate restraint on our freedom. So know what your passion is and really distinguish between what you think you need, what you think you want, and what you really desire. And then I hope someday that you meet your teacher, the face of your teacher, as it says in the Jewish tradition, when you go to visit your rabbi on Shabbos, for some people it's when you move, go into the town and you realize you're in the aura of where the rabbi's town is, your cares drop away. For some other people, it's not until you kiss the mezuzah on the door and walk into the rabbi's house that your cares drop away. But for some people whose cares are so deep, it's not till you see the rabbi's face that you take a deep breath and you let it go. Now you find that face.